So let me start by saying thank you for inviting me to be keynote at this conference. I'm very happy, very pleased to be able to discuss about uh, physical and social human robot interaction. This is a um, very special piece of work that we carry out at our institute because it involves roboticists and psychologists. This is uh, not very common in at least in the research, uh, robotics research community to work together. Um, starting from such different fields. I'm Giorgio Metta, I'm the scientific director of the Italian Institute of Technology based in Genoa, Italy. So let's delve deep uh, into the presentation, uh, but I'd like to start first from the, a bit of history. So um, the whole endeavor on developing robotics, uh, at least for me, started with the ICAM project. It is, um, uh, it was a European project started in 2004, whose goal was to design a human robot um, in hardware and software. Uh, specifically, a robot uh, can, um, in a sense, be used to develop uh, embodied uh, artificial intelligence. So this was the main goal of the project, to develop the platform and uh, to study certain aspects related to uh, artificial intelligence. So the robot was developed as a European endeavor. It, in a sense, starting from uh, this uh, image that summarizes what we like, wanted to achieve with this project, there, which is a very complicated humanoid that can help people in a variety of tasks. In order to help people, the robot would have needed to be able to interact, to interact naturally in different ways, uh, both physically, like in this image to carry weights, for instance, and also socially to understand what the requests from the human user uh, will be. Um, this is the result of the project. It took about three and a half years to actually uh, develop the full hardware of the robot, starting from scratch, basically. And, um, and this is basically what we achieved. Um, I'll get a bit more into the details of the robot platform itself. The robot was designed with hands. The hands are the most complicated part of the robot body. We wanted hands to be um, able to do, for instance, precision grip or in hand manipulation. This is a very complicated task, so you can imagine the complexity of designing hands of this type. Um, we also wanted the robot to be equipped with sensors. Um, as you can imagine, cameras are very easy these days. So, uh, we put cameras for vision, we put microphones for uh, hearing, for uh, perceiving sound. Um, but we also, since we wanted to work on interaction, we designed a full-blown um, tactile system, so an artificial skin to cover most of the robot body. Um, we'll see uh, a bit more later. Um, we also, since we wanted to design a robot for research, we made it completely open um, following a GPL license. And both in hardware and software, I think it's important because it allowed many, many people to actually work with this platform. Um, hence, uh, we see a short video here that shows um, how the hand of the robot uh, will grasp an object. Here, the robot is using actually vision to identify an object, to actually build a 3D reconstruction of the object and planning uh, grass type. And you can appreciate, I think, um, the complexity of the hand here. Um, with respect to sensors, as I say, cameras and microphones are easy. Um, tactile, it's been more difficult. It actually required three and a half years to develop a full body cover uh, with tactile sensors. These are the results. Um, the technology is fairly simple, but nonetheless, um, whenever you embark into developing new, new technology, um, you know, it takes time. Uh, we want also something to be very, very robust because, um, you know, skin or body contacts with the environment are very frequent in a robot this type, and it's important to be able to sense interaction with the environment. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the project was um, made open source. This is important. We create a community of users, so people using the robot in different um, parts of the world. Um, we have robots as far as uh, University of Tokyo, for instance, uh, KAIST in Korea, um, ASTAR in Singapore, and 
there are many robots, as you can see, in Europe, and the reason is that um, because of European funding or um, European Commission support, um, universities manage to buy, or research institutes manage to buy uh, the ICAP. The ICAP, by the way, I didn't say that, but it's 250k euros, so it's fairly expensive, and um, it's a sort of a commitment to actually buy one. Um, this community um, was very important, allowed to generate um, tons of code. Um, there are more than 6 million lines at this point, and, um, which doesn't say much about the quality of the software developed, but it says that, or it testifies the fact that the community is very, very alive. And actually, um, among the open source, let's say, community, our site, our repositories are in the top 2% worldwide, which is quite uh, an accomplishment for a small robotics community at the day. So let's see more on actual experiments using the robot. I'm going to be talking first about the physical human-robot interaction, which is made of um, robot sensing. I discussed it already, but also um, building sensors, building um, ways to sense what the person is doing. Uh, here from this picture, you can see very easily or you can see that what we wanted to do is actually to have a sensorized suit to sense precisely what the person is doing and use this information in human robot interaction. Um, this video here uh, shows in principle what the robot can do um, from the sensing point of view and also what type of interaction we may want to achieve. Here the robot is doing something difficult like balancing on a single leg and uh, Experimenter is actually perturbing the robot, applying external forces, and the robot still maintains the balance. This is um, because of the uh, tactile sensors that are distributed across the entire body. Um, let's see more on the measuring human movement. Here we have um, a description of the system that we develop. Uh, as I said, it's a sensorized suit with inertial sensors and um, also a sensorized uh, shoe with four sensors. We'll see in a moment why we need these both uh, types of sensors uh, in order to measure accurately what the person is doing. And potentially we like to fuse all this information into a single percept that we can pass to the robot and we can develop control algorithms that take into account what the person is doing. So as I said, um, we like to measure joint torques, we have positions, um, and the loss is, and we have external forces. So from the sensorized suit, what we measure, as we see on the equation to the left, is position and angular velocity. So what does it mean? Um, it means that basically we have uh, these um, IMUs, inertial sensors, and through integration, we actually can recover uh, the position and um, also the angular velocity of the body parts where the sensors are placed in the suit. There's a problem though, um, we need to be efficient. Uh, we need to be able to compute everything from the sensors and translate into, for instance, the joint angle of the person and the joint velocities in, um, in a very, um, very fast. Uh, the reason is that we want to compute this in real time and um, in order to be able to pass this information to the robot and generate a controller for the robot that takes this information into account. We resorted to, um, I mean, uh, I know from the equations uh, it looks very complicated, but the procedure is, in a sense, very simple. Uh, we have an interactive procedure that takes uh, this information coming from the uh, IMUs and translates into uh, angular velocities. Uh, and then through a minimization procedure, we actually compute the, uh, let's say, best estimate given that we have these angular velocities but also the body of the person may be moving. So we have to take into account that the person is floating base. Or what does it mean technically? It means that basically the person is free to move in the environment. So the base um, of the person is not attached to a single point in the environment but it's actually moving. Um, the person is freely moving in the environment. So this requires a bit more of a um, ingenuity in developing um, an algorithm to actually compute this. Um, I'll show you in the next video that actually this works very well. You see here um, a couple of people with the sensors and you see what happens. Uh, you see 
that um, there's an accurate measurement of what people are doing here. I think uh, this is a, like a starting point for what we wanted to do. The second problem, though, that um, the IMUs um, don't give us access to force information. And this is very important because we like to understand also what forces are exchanged between the robot and the person in case they are interacting or between the person and the environment because we may want to take into consideration, um, for instance, uh, how much stress that, or how much stress is applied to the joint of the person, to the muscles, um, so how much effort that the person is actually making. So we needed for this to add force sensors. This is what we done. Um, this is an example of a sensorized uh, shoe that measure forces, reaction forces from the ground. The next video shows, for instance, that we can accurately recover these forces and we have a few examples in the plot and also we can, for instance, recover the center of pressure as the person moves. Uh, in this case, the person was walking, as you can see from the rhythmic pattern uh, in the plots. Um, again, this is the information that is passed to the system, but as you can imagine, this doesn't tell us much about um, where the forces are because the, these are measured only at the shoe level. So we have to project these forces into the whole body structure that we uh, determine through the IMUs as we've seen earlier. So also this requires some additional thinking because the typical um, approach would be to write a Lagrange formulation of the uh, body dynamics. Um, from this one we can actually project forces, external forces, into uh, the, uh, let's say, the dynamics of the body and project to eventually to the joint angles if you wanted to. Uh, but this is, um, in a sense, not efficient. Um, the computational cost of this equation is very high. So we had to hack a bit into the equations and particularly use the Newton-Euler formulation, which is complicated but efficient. Um, and this is basically what we've done. And then we resorted to um, maximum a posteriori estimation, which was very standard, basically taking the measurements from the shoes and estimating all the other quantities, which are, in our case, for instance, the joint torques, which is an important um, piece of information that may then be used into a controller. <clears throat> in terms of mathematics, it's not particularly complicated per se. Uh, this equation just show that, um, I mean, through a, let's say, more or less standard optimization procedure, we can actually estimate um, these um, joint variables that are needed uh, to estimate eventually the uh, joint torques that are the important parameter we like to measure. We also have to take into account, as before, that the person may be moving in the environment, so the entire system has to take into account that the person is, uh, technically speaking, floating base. Um, here we see an example where uh, the person is wearing both uh, the sensorized suit, uh, which is the IMUs, and uh, the sensorized shoes. And uh, you see here a representation that shows how much force and fatigue uh, the person is, is, in a sense, making. Uh, the color of the balls uh, you see in the plot uh, represent how much stress is being applied to that particular joint. And we have also an estimation of the external forces as we saw in the, in the plots. Um, now, uh, we know that the robot can measure interaction with the environment through the skin and through additional force source sensors the robot is equipped with. We know that the person has been sensorized, so, so the person uh, can be measured. Now what we have to do, as we can see from this slide, um, we have to build a model that shows the interaction between the two. Uh, here the number of equations double, basically, uh, because we need an equation for the dynamic of the human, as before, and an equation for the dynamics of the robot. Also we need to take into account context, um, so there are additional constraints that um, basically represent where the person contacting the robot and how the two are interacting. And um, from this, we, through um, basically uh, an optimal control approach, we can actually um, compute uh, the controller for the robot in order to take into account the interaction with the person. There are various ways of doing this. 
one example may be uh, to make the robot compliant, which means uh, that the robot will basically follow what the person is doing or what the person is trying to do. Or we can even, um, in a more sophisticated controller, make the robot help the person. So these are all possibilities. Uh, the goal of the controller, of course, uh, need to be stated uh, beforehand. Um, there's um, an issue though, and uh, something we have to take into account. We cannot just state, uh, let's say, um, in, in general terms, um, a controller that, let's say, minimizes external forces. So it's a typical in industrial robotics, for instance. Now, all the cobots these days are basically being compliant by minimizing whatever external force. But here, we have two entities interacting, and we want one to help the other. So we have to take into account, or in a sense measure, whether the, uh, let's say, the contact or the exchange of forces is helpful in a sense, either to the robot or to the person. Um, this is um, this problem um, to understand what this uh, the case. Um, we had to resort to a concept very common in the control theory called uh, Yapuno stability, through which we actually. Um, manage to identify um, moment by moment, uh, and therefore uh, the robot can take this information into account while moving, whether a force is helping stability or not helping stability. If it's helping stability, we can actually follow that force. So if the person is trying to help the robot to get up, we can have the robot follow that rather than resisting the, um, the external force. Okay, um, this is basically summarized in this slide where we show the different components of the force along a possible, let's say, hypothetical trajectory of the robot. And uh, we show that the human perturbation can be helpful or not helpful. And depending on which one we measure, we can actually uh, design or take it into account into the controller or simply neglect it. Um, this is an example a video that actually showed this happening. Um, Unfortunately, to actually perceive what's happening, you will need to probably be there and be lifting the robot. But believe me, uh, what happens, and you can appreciate maybe from the stability of the controller, is that the robot is being helped by the person and is not resisting the external force that's being generated by the person. Of course, we can do the opposite. We can have the robot helping the person. So it depends on how we configure the task. And uh, this other video, uh, I think this is also very nice, it shows two robots cooperating, of course, um, the same controllers, the same set of equations um, hold, and um, the two robots can actually cooperate in a joint task. From this one, um, you can imagine also cooperating or having multiple robots or um, robots with people cooperating in joint tasks where they have to lift objects or to move things around. So this is, a, let's say, the starting point to get uh, to more complicated controllers. But the theory is basically there, and these experiments show that actually it works. So let's move to a slightly different topic. Um, so we discussed about physical human-robot interaction. You or we saw um, what we done in that direction. There's another level of interaction, which is less physical, uh, but none, nonetheless, it's very, very important if you have to design uh, robots that can help people. And this is a social level. So in the next video, you see um, an example of this. Um, so the robot is interacting with a the person. Uh, there's no speech. Uh, communication happens only through gestures, to gaze. Um, why is this important? Because a robot that can communicate implicitly uh, what it's going to do, uh, what um, actions it's going to take, is uh, very, very important, I think. Uh, and will facilitate the interaction, will make it more natural. So um, let's see the experiments we designed in this direction. Um, we start with a um, very classical, um, at least in an experimental psychology, positive QM um, experiment. Uh, what happens here, we basically have um, two situations. So, so um, there's a, a, a stimulus that can, let's, let's focus on the left part of the slide, there's stimulus, an arrow, that can, um, uh, can indicate a certain direction. 
and there's a letter appearing either in the direction of the arrow or in the opposite direction. If it appears in the direction of the arrow, this is called a valid queued location, and we can measure, for instance, reaction times, how long it takes to the person to identify the letter. Um, vice versa, if the arrow is pointing in the opposite direction of where the letter appears, this, this is called an invalid queued location. Of course, we can do the same with gaze. Um, so we can do gaze queuing, and we can do gaze queuing with the robot. We see different things here. We see the robot that is uh, looking at you, or at the subject of the experiment in this case, um, and then looking in a certain direction, and then there's a, a letter appearing in one of the screens. And as you can see, the letter change, and also um, the position of the letter can be opposite to where the robot is looking. Um, also, the robot may not make eye contact with the person, and um, also can then look in one, left or right, and the letter will appear left or right. Okay, what do we get with this experiment? We get the following. If there's eye contact, um, there's a difference between the validly and invalidly acute locations in terms of reaction times. And um, in case there's no eye contact, um, there's no difference. It's not statistically significant. Um, here, there's an additional parameter that I'd like to discuss related to this experiment. It's called uh, is the so-called um, stimulus onset asynchrony, SOA, in brief. Um, here was set to a certain value. We'll see in a moment uh, uh, we can change that value and, ch and this changes things. Um, the reason that um, this is uh, an important parameter is because, of course, your brain takes time before taking a certain decision. And the more time you have, uh, the more time, let's say, for a cube location to be, become active and therefore influence your reaction times. Um, in fact, if we change the SOA, what we see here is that uh, the situation changes. So there's basically um, no difference between the eye contact versus the no eye contact condition. Um, for this experiment, we also recorded uh, EEG. Uh, this is important to also validate or to strengthen the, uh, the experiment uh, by showing that also we see a difference in brain activation. So it's yet another um, piece of information um, that is describing how the specific interaction between the robot and the person happened. Um, here is the EEG part. Um, we, in the case of eye contact, we see there's a difference between the validly um, queued locations and invalid queued location, um, and uh, we can measure uh, this difference um, certain time. These are average plots, um, but of course, um, the, if you do the statistics, ANOVA, uh, whatever, you determine that it is, uh, in fact, uh, statistically significant. Um, and um, this is a recording from specific electrodes um, uh, in the um, parietal, parietal occipital lobe uh, that are uh, known to be related to attention. What happens if there is no eye contact? Also, the EEG will tell basically um, corresponds one to one to what has been shown with the reaction time experiment, uh, showing that in fact there's a difference between the valid and invalid cues and um, same same electrodes. So uh, this is uh, let's say. Uh, yet another or uh, complete validation that this, uh, this, uh, it's an effect on the robot. So to summarize this experiment, uh, the joint attention with the robot is motivated by the interactive effect of social and strategic top-down components, um, which basically means that we see an effect with, which wasn't um, to be given for granted before running the experiment, and um, that the robot case is actually treated as a social signal um, so, um, it's important the way we control gaze on the robot because this may determine, um, let's say, the final performance in interaction, in human robot interaction. Um, let's move to, uh, let's say, a slightly more complicated experiment. Uh, this is um, uh, an experiment where we have, we create an expectation, which means uh, we have the robot interacting with a person. Uh, there are two objects. Um, the objects may be um, in context or out, outside the context. So, for instance, in, in our case, we, 
we have uh, through um, two locations. So one is a laundry where in a bottle you expect to see soap. Another one is a drinking situation where in a bottle you expect to see orange juice. Um, and, um, and apart from this, the experiment is again a Posner experiment and we basically uh, run it in, in the same way. Uh, the robot actually saves uh, or uh, will say what um, in what situation you're in, whether you're at the laundry or at the bar, and then the robot gazes um, one object or the other and also it passes the object uh, to, um, to you. And you have uh, reaction time experiment also in the progressive key depending on um, the letter, the appearance of the letter, uh, exactly as it was an experiment. So, um, um, so this is basically, again, a summary that shows how the experiment is constructed. There's a context, uh, there's, um, uh, let's say, um, the two objects, there's gaze, and you have to say something about the two objects um, pressing the button. In our case, um, the two objects uh, were two similar balls, but there were icons on the table uh, showing uh, what object was what, whether it was orange juice or the soap, and uh, you had to press the button depending on the appearance of the letter. Um, these are the results. Uh, what is interesting to see is that in the congruent um, uh, situation, um, you have um, a validity effect, while in the incongruent situation, you don't have it. In the neutral situation, so where um, the, the generic uh, context or not context, you still have a validity effect, which basically some resembles um, the one we saw earlier. So again, this is to say that um, placing the gazing into context and having the robot behave in a congruent um, way with respect to the context, to the location you're in, to the situation you're in, um, increases or strengthens the uh, validity effect, which is, again, very, very important. Um, so, to summarize this experiment, um, joint attention is affected, indeed, by action expectations in human-robot interaction. And when gaze is congruent with the action expectations, um, there's a higher degree of uh, joint attention. Um, compared to when I see, uh, it is incongruent. Um, okay, let's move to yet another experiment, and this is uh, getting exciting here. Uh, we have um, wanted to test whether the behavior of the robot again can influence the, say, the overall performance in, uh, or how much uh, the robot behavior influences your um, performance or your engagement in social interaction with the robot. Um, we did it in various ways here. Um, we have, um, so the, the first question is, if the robot follows you more, this is important. So if you look at an object, is it um, important that the robot follows you? And if the robot does it more often, is this perceived differently? Um, so this, this was the first question. The second question is, um, or the way we measured it is, basically by letting you choose an object in this case. So you look at an object, the robot follows or not follows you, and we measure how much, how long it took to actually go back to interact with the robot. By interacting means looking at the, in the eyes of the robot. Um, this video shows the experiment. You see that we tracking gaze. Uh, the gaze tracker is actually used to tell uh, also the robot where to look and also to measure where you're looking and to measure the time it takes to re saccade to the robot face. As you can see, the person looks at the object and uh, the robot follows or not follows, and then we measure how long it takes to go back to the robot. So what are the results of this experiment? We see here um, basically that there's no difference uh, between the, uh, let's say, the identities of the robot uh, so if the robot follows you more or less, this doesn't affect, in general, um, your uh, return time. Um, what is more important, though, uh, is that there's a, uh, an effect um, 
in case the robot is following you or not following you. So, um, which means uh, it's not the personality of the robot on average, uh, but if you uh, if the robot is following you, actually, we uh, see that the latency of the saccade is uh, smaller. Um, so it, you engage more in case uh, the robot is um, is following you, uh, which is uh, I mean an interesting result because again. Uh, if you think uh, that we're designing robots um, to interact with people and uh, we want to both um, design the behavior of the robot, which means uh, how the uh, robot behaves in general, how much it, it's placed into context, um, which means basically the, the social interaction. And also, as we've seen earlier, we want the robot to be physically interacting with you doing the right things. So the two things combined, I think, are um, the, in a sense the two elements that we have to develop synergistically, in a sense, to um, get the robot behave properly. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, well, uh, this is a, again sci-fi. I'm resorting again to this type of pictures, photos, uh, showing images from a movie where the a robot was um, uh, the, the main character was a robot that was helping people. Again, for doing this type of things, we need both, uh, let's say, the social component and the physical component, and, uh, and this is uh, basically what we aiming uh, to. Um, I would like to say thank you for having uh, been with me so far. Um, I'm surely available to take questions at this point. I would also like to say thank you to all the people that were involved in to develop this type of research. It's, uh, as you can imagine, it's a very large project because we started basically from scratch designing the robot. And uh, this is the group that actually designed the robot over the many, many, many years. And, um, but also designing the human-robot interaction physical um, experiments and this, uh, pictures of the people that actually participated to those experiments. And um, we also, um, I would like to say uh, a big thank you also to the people doing the human-robot uh, interaction from the social cognition point of view that are shown here.